Largely, I was pretty happy with them. There's a few outliers that I didn't expect, basically. Uh, so we're going to try to figure out a way to um, potentially offer some way to make up that work. Um, but I'm not sure what that is yet. So we'll see what happens. Um, but look for an announcement on Piazza about it uh, as soon as I get to it. Uh, so that's the first thing. I am going to try and release a homework later today and update the syllabus later today. Um, so it would be due. I don't know if you noticed, but in the syllabus, the, the shift starts right around now of kind of homeworks being Tuesday to Tuesday because of the way the end of the semester works. It's the weirdest semester ever, but I'll announce it on Piazza, you know, et cetera. Uh, if you don't see an announcement on Piazza and I'll force notify so you don't, you can get an email uh, notifying you. Um, so if I don't release it, don't worry about it, um, but I'll see what happens. I'd like to get one out. Uh, just because I think there's some practice that could could help. Uh, I should have a lab on Friday uh, as per typical. Um, let's see what else. There is a project two coming up. Uh, that's what that uh, incorrect slide is talking about, um, which is, I believe it's whatever it is in the syllabus that is correct. Uh, it should be in about, I want to say it's like two weeks from today is when it gets released. Um, but it's uh, right around there. But I'm going to update it because we are actually from a lecture perspective, we're kind of ahead of the syllabus. So if any of you struggled with the reading um, and kind of the reading matching the lecture, it's because we got a little bit ahead. So we're like a full lecture ahead of uh, what the syllabus says. That's why I need to update it. Um, I'm also I'm kind of thinking potentially of reducing the exam impact on your overall score. Um, I don't know, any show of hands preference uh, more, do you prefer lower value exams and higher homeworks raise your right hand or do you prefer higher value exams and lower value homeworks raise your left hand okay interesting um yeah because i'm definitely an exam person uh so i do much better on exams than i do on on submitting homeworks i know a lot of people are the opposite so uh i was just kind of curious to get a poll uh, I think that's it. Any questions? So in theory, they're the same, but that was actually one thing I was going to mention is um, it is a manual process to set the total score on an assignment in Blackboard. It doesn't pick it up from Gradescope. So there's at least a couple that are wrong. So we need to fix that. But in theory, your score in Gradescope and your score in Blackboard should be the same. Now, that said, there was the midterm and the midterm alternate. So you should be only seeing a column called midterm in Blackboard. Um, and that should be whichever one you took, if I set it up correctly. It's like, it, it should be a raw score. Yeah, but both. But I can check if maybe there may be a broken column or something because the Blackboard ones are very like manually created. I'll I'll check Blackboard because I got to check the the misalignment. So maybe there's something there that's not supposed to be. Does that make sense? But it should just be called midterm, and it should be it should be exactly the same as what you have in grade school. Okay. So yeah, so grade scope is right definitely. Blackboard should be right because what I'm using. Mostly what I want you to see Blackboard for is to give you kind of your current grade in the class, which is not you, not something you can get out of grade scope. Yeah. I did not. I'm not planning to, no. Um, the grades were pretty solidly where I expected them. Uh, like I said, with some outliers that I would like to figure out how to fix. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, that was that, somebody sent me an email about that today, um, and that was the trigger that. And now I think there's actually at least two that are wrong. Um, so basically, it's like they get cloned from last semester, but then if you change the grade scope test or thing, it doesn't update Blackboard, and I must just forgotten to update Blackboard. Yeah. Sounds about right. Yeah, that's like the that's the raw score, right? So you have to divide it out to get a percentage of a hundred. Really? Yeah. All right. 
Did you get one email or two emails about the midterm? One. You only got one or did you get two from Gradescope? One. one. All right. So I, I believe it's 84, but I think the final total value, like total points available uh, in the midterm and the midterm alternate test were not the same. So it could be that it got one got transmuted with the other or something like that. So like I said, I'm going to, I need like an hour to like actually like dig through it because it's not something I can do off the cuff. Uh, so hopefully I'll get it all sorted by the time lecture happens on Thursday. So if it looks weird, um, you know, like within a few points, it's none of it is wildly wrong. It's like just enough wrong to be annoying. Um, so you should be in the right, right ballpark, but I'll try to get it all corrected by the end of the day tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, sorry if it's any of it's confusing. Um, the tool chain is rough some days. All right. Any other questions? So now I know a whole laundry list of things I need to check about Grayscope and Blackboard. All right. So let's move on. Ignore the stupid announcements. Um, all right. So just a little bit of review. The p value is the observed significance level. P value is the chance that if the null hypothesis is true, that the test statistic, and, and just to be clear, right? So notice that that the test statistic, that doesn't necessarily mean all things, right? But the thing you're testing uh, is equal to the value that was observed in the data or is even further in the direction of the alternative. So in other words, um, if, if it's basically what it's trying to say is that, you know, what you're trying to prove most of the time is the alternative. That's why the null is called the null. Okay, does anybody know what the word null means? Any fantasy book readers? You don't have to admit it. All right, so null, like, it's a very common word in the programming world. It's one of those words where it's so common that I can't remember how commonly it is in regular English. Um, but so null means like, it, you know, doesn't exist, right? So, or like void, okay? which is not the same as zero, right? Like, you know, the absence of everything, okay? So like, I don't know, not space, but not really space, right? It's like a void. It's the absence of all things, even a zero. So a null is just not there, okay? So what we're really looking to prove with, with most of the stuff we're doing is the alternative, but we set it up in terms of the null because that's how we can test it. Does that make sense? Because you can't test like infinity, which is normally where the alternative lies, but you can test a specific thing, okay? So, all right. Hey, look, we haven't seen one of these in a while. Uh, so what does the p-value represent? Oh, it's interesting. They, they changed the format on me. I actually see the right answer right now now. All right, get your answers in. We don't have a lot of time today. There's a lot of content, and I decided to be late, and there were a lot of questions. And the elevator doesn't work. All right, moving on. All right, so I think it looks like a lot of people got the right answer. Which is good. So if the null hypothesis is true that the test ticket, test statistic, easy for me to say, is equal to the value that was observed in the data that's even further in the direction of the alternate. All right. And here we have baby buggies again, just to talk about shuffling labels. Okay. Um, so what we want to do is a random permutation to shuffle those labels around so that uh, what we can do is say, hey, look, we, we came to a conclusion based on the way the data came in. And then we want to go and shuffle some of the labels to see if that conclusion goes away, right? So if we shuffle them around, and these are just kind of the tools you use it with, um, but basically they're all variants on sample and whether you're doing it with replacement or without replacement. But so if we shuffle those labels around, what we should do is go back to, there shouldn't be anything kind of interesting. And that means that the smoking versus non-smoking is interesting, okay? 
All right, so if the null is true, all rearrangements of labels are equally likely. So uh, obviously you're going to focus your, your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis on kind of one aspect, one statistic. And so that's all this is talking about, is that if you shuffle the labels on the thing that's giving you that statistic, so remember a statistic is calculated, um, then we should be able to get back to even, right? It shouldn't show a difference unless we put the labels back. And the way we deal with, um, you know, random randomness in the world, right, is by doing it over and over and over again so that we can kind of control for that randomness. All right. So can we conclude that the maternal smoking causes lighter birth weights? So we have a really strong association, but there's probably not enough research here to make this a true causal relationship, okay? But it's pretty close. From kind of the information we have, it's probably causal. But from, you know, from the world at large, it might need some more study. All right, another question, look at that. See when it rains, of course. Hopefully it's not gonna cause it to rain when we leave. All right, can we conclude uh, that maternal smoking causes lighter birth weights? And note the bold. I mean, you can see the bold. Yeah, it's kind of washed out, but there, one of the words is bolded. All right, answers in. All right. And so largely was the correct answer with no. Um, this is a little bit tricky, right? Like, um, you know, because it, it feels causal, um, but it's hard to say that that's 100% true with the little slice of the picture that we have. All right, uh, so this is a nice little surgeon to show a nice graphic. Um, we, I think, I don't know if we have a demo about this today. We do have a demo about this data, I believe, later. Um, but so what we can see here, right, is so we have the Apple App Store and Google Play, um, and this is basically consumer spend in those stores, okay? Now, what's wrong with this graphic as far as making a conclusion about where do you wanna host your app, right? Or let's ask this, where do you wanna host your app based on the amount of money you're gonna make? At the Apple App Store, right? Because um, clearly most of the money is spent on the Apple App Store. It started out much higher, but it's evening out a bit. But it's still definitely, if you're going to invest in something, you should put it in the Apple App Store, not in Google Play, per this graph. However, what is this not taking into account? Right? And there's a hint right there. Right, so uh, domestically, uh, like in the U.S. versus worldwide, that could be a, a control factor. Maybe it's much higher if you look at the global uh, economy, right? Because this is just, oh, no, this is worldwide. Uh, so maybe it's, it's, maybe it's all Google Play in the U.S., right? Okay, good example. All right, what else? And, and we all, for all we know, right, that, you know, this much of the money is actually U.S. money. Right, which so it might matter a lot whether you're looking at worldwide or US data. Any other ideas? Right, so, so if you're gonna draw a conclusion about where should you focus your application efforts, it may be worth considering what percentage you're getting, right? Versus, um, you know, the, the overall spend might be a dollar, but if you're seeing a nickel out of that in the Apple App Store, but you're getting, 50 cents out of the Google Play Store, it might be worthwhile to use the Play Store. Um, 
in fact, Amazon uh, Kindle has just removed the ability to buy anything, any books out of the Kindle, out of the uh, uh, Google App Store because they upped the percentage they were taking and they didn't feel like they were making enough profit. So because of capitalism, a great user experience went away. Um, all right, any other ideas? All right, here's the biggest one I think is here, which is that there's other reasons why people choose the uh, uh, basically the ecosystem they live in. So this is the, the green box problem, right? Or a green message problem. Uh, there are a lot of students who choose iPhones so that they can communicate with other iPhone users and not look weird, right? Um, I explicitly bought one of my children an iPhone to solve for this problem, all right? Uh, this is purely manufactured by Apple. There are well-known standards. Google calls them out every year, basically, for this personally BS um, that they can solve for this problem. But they choose not to because the walled garden that Apple has created benefits them a lot. Okay. Another example is that Apple early on established um, kind of a, an expectation that you buy apps where Android kind of went the opposite way and kind of actually, you know, set up an expectation that you don't buy apps, that a lot of apps are free. So as a result, people in the iPhone ecosystem are way more likely to buy the same exact application than they would on Android, just because of the expectation of the community. So all of those factors, some of the ones that you brought up, right? Some of the ones I'm bringing up may make a decision here, not a good one because the lack of random assignment. That makes sense. So like my examples are more about random assignment. There's also things like there's other things to consider about, you know, how could you make the most money in your app store endeavor, right? All right. So iOS users spend two times as much as Android users on third party apps. And so is higher spending caused by users owning iPhones? Like if they went over to Android, would that same person be spend the same amount of money in the Android world, you know, assuming all the all the software was the same or available? What do you think? Right. I mean, it's here, right? They, we can't tell because you're not randomly assigned phones, right? Um, you know, maybe all of you are as like it's usually early teenagers because your parents bought it for you, so you took the one they gave you, right? Um, but you know, as you get older, you're making your own choices about what phones you're going to choose. So you're not being randomly assigned. So it's not a good way to measure an ecosystem. Um, and some of the things we brought up, right? Income, geography, et cetera. Uh, although now you can spend just as much money on an Android phone as you can on an iPhone, but that it used to be that Androids were generally significantly less money. Um, but now you can go drop a thousand bucks on a phone in either camp. Um, all right, so importance of randomized controlled experiments. I know this is most of a review, but this is kind of really important to the crux of what we're doing. Uh, so we have sample A, which we call the control group, and sample B, which is the treatment group, and that's how we get to uh, A, B testing, right? Um, so shorthand for the control group is A, and then the treatment group is B, okay? Um, and if the treatment and control groups are selected at random, then you can start to make causal conclusions. Um, and otherwise, the difference is because of chance or the treatment. So, and how do we control for chance? Somebody said it over here. Louder? Multiple trials. Uh, so we do it over and over again, right? Um, and it, that's the advantage we have with doing data science computationally, right? Um, doing it over and over again when it's talking about a medical trial, it's a lot harder, right? Uh, so when we, when we can do things purely computationally, it gives us uh, some advantages that we can, we can do a lot more of over and over again, right? Hey, right, here comes a question. All right, so what is a reason for the difference between the two groups when we're talking about an AB, uh, you know, controlled experiment or controlled randomized experiment?
Remember, it doesn't say anything about controlling for anything here. All right, answers in. In case anybody's interested, someone in my family just got the wordle. All right, closing the answers theoretically. All right. All right, so, um, you know, maybe I should have added into the question, right? We're not controlling for chance. Okay, so the answer here is both treatment and chance. Uh, there it is in green. So now you know it's really true. Um, okay, so just kind of how do we talk about randomization? Okay, um, and so this is a bunch of slides. Um, so at the outset, right, we have an equal chance of either. Okay, and the the two straws are two different sizes purely to make them more visually distinct. Don't imagine them as easier to grab. Okay, so um, but you know if you can't tell the difference between the, the white and the pink. Um, it's easier to tell that one's taller than the other. So we have two groups. We have a whole bunch of treatment and we have a whole bunch of control, okay? And what we do is we evenly divide those groups up and assign them randomly to each group. And there can be a bunch of different ways that we do the random assignment, but the best way is to kind of collect all of your participants, whether they're humans or you know other kinds of data, it doesn't really matter. Um, and actually kind of run a randomizing algorithm on them. Uh, but there's other ways too, where you can kind of select at random, et cetera. Um, but the point is, is that you wanna make sure that it is truly random and that way you are able to uh, get a valuable outcome. Because if they're not random, then it's likely that, the, that your uh, experiment is gonna be flawed. Um, and so then we end up with a treatment group and a control group, and you go off on your merry way with your experiment. Um, you know, and there's lots of different components to randomness. Um, but I think you know we've talked about this a bunch, so hopefully this makes sense. And so kind of going back to the hypotheses, um, kind of the I think we talked about this already, um, but the null hypothesis in the population, the distribution of all potential control scores is the same as the distribution of all potential treatment scores. So in other words, the treatment has no effect, but this long story short, right, is that um, what, we're, what we're saying is that the two groups will be equal, okay? And then in this one, we're saying the treatment, and don't forget this can be anything, you know, they drink milk every day, okay? It doesn't have to be like a medical treatment. Um, and that's how we get to the, the treatment scores. Uh, and the reason we talk about pain improves here is, um, has anybody here ever heard of using Botox for anything? What what go, comes to mind when you think of Botox? Yeah, so stop sweating. Uh, wrinkles is another big one. Um, making your face not move at all is another one. I don't think they do that by design though. But in fact, there's actually been a bunch of research about actually using Botox for pain management as well. Uh, and so the example we're gonna look at is actually some experimentation results uh, from pain management. So uh, we are not talking about whether or not you will look better with Botox or not. We're talking about uses that are about uh, trying to do pain management, et cetera. <laughs> so. All right. Wait, this is, we're on 14, right? So me having uh, fifth, uh, 13 open is not gonna be very useful to anyone. Right. So the first thing we're going to do is run. I was actually selected. Um, I didn't think it was. There we go. 
okay, uh, run our usual setup. Um, and then we have these two methods that we actually divide, uh, talked about in the last lecture. So that's why I'm not gonna talk about them today. Um, the difference of means. So, you know, comparing uh, the two sets of averages and doing one simulated difference uh, so that, you know, to try to uh, simplify our repeat process, right? Um, and we'll load those up. All right. And so here we have a data set that is an actual, like it was actually a, a, a real um, medical test. Okay. And so basically I pulled sample here. Normally I would just do show, but this data is sorted. So you would only see, I think controls are first and then treatments are second. But so I just pulled sample to show you that basically we have um, this person received the treatment, so received the Botox, and they had a positive outcome. Okay, so their pain was better managed, whatever that means. Um, but this one received the treatment and there was no change. Okay, uh, and then the control, obviously, sometimes, although we didn't get it in our sample here, sometimes the pain gets better with the control. Okay, um, and you know, this could just be time, right? It just whatever it was, the pain they were trying to manage, they just healed, whatever it was. Um, but it could also be a placebo effect, right? Uh, where they think they're getting the, the treatment, uh, but they're not, but then their brain basically causes them to solve the problem on its own, which is a whole nother very interesting uh, world. Um, and let's see. All right, so, all right, so you should all know this from the midterm, what will be a good way to kind of see this data, but not, uh, you know, in just one long strip, what would be a better way to show that? Anybody else? Ideas over there? Oh, how about you? A pivot table, exactly. My favorite. All right. Also known well in the startup world. All right. And it's a oops. Uh, it's a little confusing because we have a column called group. Um, but so this way we can see right that the control uh, fourteen of them had no change, but two of them did have a change in the course of the study, uh, and then the treatment group. Six of them had no change, but nine of them had a positive change. So kind of just on the face of it, we look at it and we say, oh, maybe there is something to that treatment. But we can't, that's not kind of good enough, right? Um, so, but another way we can look at this data, right, is we can actually do the group and group. Oops. Oh my goodness. All right. And so what we can do is look at the averages, right? So what this tells us, right, is that the control is very close to zero, okay? So in other words, not a lot of the time is the control being helped by basically the passage of the time during the medical experiment, whereas in the treatment, it's, it's significant, right? It's, it's coming up there. So we, we start to see that, oh, maybe, you know, kind of another proof point that the treatment is, is higher. Um, you know, and this becomes much more interesting maybe when these numbers are quite a bit bigger and closer, right? Then it might be more obvious the difference if you kind of take the averages, right? And then basically what we're trying to do is also get a sense of our data. So how many rows do we have in total? Um, but what we're doing here is uh, another kind of concept, which we don't talk about much in this class, but you will talk about in later data science classes, which is called exploratory data analysis, um, which is a like a lot of words for the very simple process of, it helps a lot if you remember the, the spinny wheel, right? It helps a lot if you can get a sense of the data before trying to figure out your experiments or how your experiments should work. Um, you might walk in with a hypothesis, right? They wouldn't have run this trial if they didn't think that Botox was gonna help pain management. Right, it, like that would be kind of worth uh, worthless. But that means, okay, now we've got an output, but now we just have a whole bunch of data. We think it's gonna show some trends, but trying to get a sense of what that data like kind of feels like is really helpful. And that process is called exploratory data analysis 
or EDA for short. So um, if you encounter EDA, that's what it means. All right, so what we want to start to do now is um, kind of test our hypothesis, right? We established a hypothesis that um, treatment with Botox is going to have an effect. So in other words, our null hypothesis is that um, it's not going to have any effect to give the patient Botox. Um, and our, our alternative hypothesis is that uh, applying Botox will have an effect on the pain that they're experiencing. Um, so uh, we start to build almost in exactly the same way we've kind of been doing a bunch of experiments is that we start to look at the difference of means, right? And so, oops, can't find my mouse. Um, so if we go back up here, so this, uh, I was just looking at, um, so what this is gonna do, right, is it's gonna take our data set reduce it to being just the averages and then look at the difference between them so that we can see how far apart they are. Because that's important because while this is interesting, what we wanna know is how far apart they are because that's the part we actually care about, not the raw numbers. So we come up with uh, 475 and obviously we could have computed that easily, but if we wanna do a bunch of experiments around it, we want to have a method to do it. Um, and then we run one simulated difference. So this is where we're going to basically create a new data set by shuffling the labels, right, new, um, and then uh, basically do the same difference of means technique, except we're going to do it with the shuffled labels. So we should see. what. So what? what do you... If we're correct, in other words, if our alternative hypothesis is correct, what do we expect from the output of this method? We shuffled the labels. What do we expect it to be? It's going to be something, right? It, it's going to be an average distance between the two sets, okay? Either the control group and the treatment group. What do we expect it to be? Close to zero, right? So hopefully it will be. Eh, it's not too far. OK, um, but we're not controlling for chance, right? We've just done it once. So in other words, we want to do it a whole bunch of times. So I think in my testing, I said, let's do it 10,000 times. And basically, we're going to do exactly the same thing we did here. So we're just going to grab this and replace our question marks here. And then what do we have to do with this? What do we have to do here? I guess maybe you can read it. What for? Right. So we have to we have to append it to something outside our for loop, right? Because otherwise, at the end of this, it's just going to drop out of existence. So every time we go through the for loop, the simulated diffs here is going to be, if we hadn't declared it up here, is going to be empty again. Okay. In fact, we'd actually probably get an error because we tried to append to something that doesn't exist. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to cut and paste it uh, from the cheat sheet. Um, but so basically, all we do is append to our existing uh, array. Um, and this new uh, run of the of the thing, right? Um, and so it's still cooking because we're doing it ten thousand times. Uh, I have on occasion given this lecture and act or similar lectures and accidentally typed in like a hundred thousand and just been here for a while. All right. So now everybody loves the histogram. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, now let's look at the distribution of those distances between the groups. Okay. And to someone's point over here, um, we expect the largest towers, right, to be at zero, right? Because we're expecting the null hypothesis to fail. We're expecting the alternative to be true. And 
but obviously just because we expect that to happen, we still have to prove it. So in other words, we're gonna shuffle those labels over and over again for 10,000 times. And we're gonna calculate the distance between them. And we expect it to be close to zero if the alternative is true. Why is that? Because our null hypothesis says there's going to be no change if we apply the treatment. Our alternative says there will be a change if we apply the treatment. So what we're going to do is we're going to run 10,000 experiments of trying to show that there's no change if we don't apply the treatment. Okay. I know this gets a little convoluted, but basically what we're doing is we're saying, okay, I shuffled those labels around. So if I shuffle them around in random ways, um, then what I should get back is no change, which means that the null hypothesis is true, right? Except that's not what our actual data is. Our actual data is the original one, which did show a difference. So therefore, we can conclude that our, our alternative hypothesis is the one that's actually true. Does that make sense? Like I said, it's a little convoluted, um, but if you kind of like work through the steps, it does, it, it makes sense. It's just kind of weird to, it's especially weird to say out loud. Um, okay, and so finally, to kind of, you know, what we want to do is kind of capture all of that, right, you know, in like a single result. And that's kind of what the p-value is for, okay? And so what our p-value says is, you know, this very low number. Okay, so in other words, when we are drawing or when we're thinking about it, it means that our calculations are in the space of the alternative, very close to the actual data set or further out. So for there, either the, the like data is, excuse me, either the data is um, disproving the null hypothesis slightly or disproving it a lot. Okay. So basically the further out you get, the better. Because what you want is you want to like soundly disprove the null hypothesis. Does that make sense? Right, but we're testing all on the null hypothesis. So we want a bad result, which is weird, right? But that's kind of what we're looking for. Okay, so let me go back to the slides. All right, so uh, next we're gonna introduce TVD. And before we explain what that really is, we'll just talk about it as a section header, but do notice it has a little magnifying glass, but we're gonna talk about it a bunch, so. All right, so um, this was a similar kind of case to the one we talked about last time, which is basically, is the jury pool representative of um, the county in which the case is taking place? Um, and the Alameda County jury pools. And so does anybody here know what the ACLU is? ACLU? Yes, I think, I'm not sure on the U, but yeah, I think it's union. Um, so this is a, what's called a lobby group uh, that specifically focuses on trying to, you know, kind of improve equality right, for lack of a better term, but really it's civil liberties in general, okay, and so that can be, that can be a little broad reaching. If you're ever going to start a lobby group, right, what you don't want to do is limit the scope, right, you want to have something pretty broad so that you can kind of change with the times. ACLU has been around for a long time. A particular chapter, I think, is what they call them, but basically one of the subunits of the overall ACLU of Northern California uh, uh, kind of did this study, Okay, so this wasn't like a court case per se in that, like the one we talked about the other day, uh, but rather they went and looked at all of the jury pools for all the court cases that took place in this county over a period of time um, and tried to say, you know, was it, was the distribution of the population accurate? Okay. So specifically, um, we talked about this more last time. I should probably, I should probably have a copy of this slide and the other one. Um, but so the eligible juries in a, eligible jurors in a, in a county and in uh, I think the data set they're looking at uh, the age is 18 um, and the gender is either right um, so it's not limited to 
you know, men over, I think it was 21 in the other case we talked about. Um, and then you end up with a jury panel. Uh, like I said, typically a jury panel is like 100-ish, depends on the county, depends on what kind of case, but generally around 100. And then you pick the actual jury, which often is around 12. Um, and so what the law says, okay, so section 197 of this particular part of the California law, all persons selected for jury service shall, shall be selected at random from a source or sources inclusive of a representative cross section of the population in the area served by the court. So the ACLU probably through anecdotal evidence uh, believed that maybe this wasn't being done properly, right? So they commissioned a study. Um, and so what we start to worry about is the, this distance between distribution. So in other words, so the people on the panels are of multiple ethnicities and the distribution of those ethnicities is categorized or categorical, sorry. Um, and so, so basically we know what the distribution should be. And so therefore we can do, you know, kind of the, the same kind of procedures we've been doing to actually see if the results that took place in re the real world are what uh, it should have been, right? Or, you know, within a certain error, you know, percentage. And so in order to do that, uh, we will go back to the demo. And basically, it's kind of like the advanced version of the thing we did the other day. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a little table that has, um, so these, these are approximately correct numbers, okay? So the ethnicity, uh, you know, kind of the label of the ethnicity, the eligible population as a percentage of the overall population, and then the number of panels, um, that, that this class appeared in, right? And so what we can see is, um, well, actually here, we'll ask you, what can we conclude about this data regarding the ethnicity of the population versus the ethnicity of the panels that were actually in panel, which is always a fun word to say. Any, any theories from this data? Right, so, so white is actually perfect, which is kind of interesting, but Latinos, as they're, they categorize, were underrepresented in the panels. Blacks were also underrepresented in the panels, but Asians were overrepresented in the panels, and, and whoever other is was also overrepresented. So in other words, it's, it's definitely off, right? But is it significantly off? Is it interestingly off? We're not really sure. Right. So it is something, though, that you, you say to this and you look at it and you're kind of like, eh, you know, the fact that this looks like it's nearly double makes you say, hey, maybe we should investigate this more deeply. All right. And then we'll go back to our pictures. Yes, everybody loves pictures. All right. Um, and so when I say TVD, does anybody have immediate answer what that stands for? And I'm looking for not the correct answer. That would be TBD. This is TVD. Right on. So this is my immediate thought every single time I see it. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad we, we share that pop culture worthless knowledge. Um, but yeah, so not the Vampire Diaries. Uh, however, maybe they'll help you remember what it actually is, uh, which is the total variation distance. Okay. So for each category, what we want to do is compute the difference in proportion between the two distributions. Then we take the absolute value of each difference, sum it, and then divide the sum by two. So this is where it gets a little bit weird, but we'll talk about that in a second. So basically, what we're trying to say is, okay, we have two distributions, right? We have um, the distribution of the ethnicity of reality, right? The county ethnicity distribution. And then we have the uh, distribution of the panels. Okay, and what we're trying to do is find out the difference or the distance between those two things. Okay, and to do that, we use the total variation distance. However, 
we want to get rid of essentially we want to kind of get rid of negative numbers okay we want to even it out so that remember i was talking about we want to talk about distance rather than 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 direction um and so because a lot of times when we're doing any kind of statistical stuff it's simpler to think about it in terms of distance rather than um the direction so that's why we sum it and then divide the sum by two so we sum it to kind of even it out and then we divide the sum by two to kind of get rid of the fact that we summed it okay so what's interesting with or at least i think is interesting a lot of, a lot of like kind of trickier stuff in statistics is that like the answer is actually ludicrous right like like it's not it's not measurable as like feet or something okay what we're looking at is this distance is a way of calculating it such that we're consistent about how we do the calculation and we get kind of a uniform mechanism for calculating distance whether the actual output value is an actual distance or not does that make sense so as long as we're consistent about how we do it we can now compare apples to apples okay even if we're looking at things that are completely kind of unrelated we can then know that if we use this technique then the difference between those two things and the difference between these two things even if this is the you know the distributions of apples and oranges and this is the distribution of you know ethnicity on panels and in a county we can then we can still compare the output does that make sense yes all right so some of the things that we end up with are not always kind of back backwards compatible in a sense with looking at the thing that they're supposed to be measuring all right so now we have a demo and so sorry let me catch up over here um okay so the first thing we do and we're going to talk more i think or did we talk about models i think we mentioned it a little bit uh, we're going to talk more about models but we're going to call this variable model because our model here, this is the model of the true distribution of people in the county. Okay. And we're kind of being a little arbitrary, right? We're just going to say, okay, you know, for whatever reason we had them listed in the particular order we did. So Asian, I think black, white, um, no, sorry, Latino, white, uh, and then other. Okay. But we could reorder them. It doesn't matter as long as we're consistent throughout, right? And then we're going to say, okay, our sample proportions. So remember what this function does is there's an infinite pool out there that is distributed in this way. Okay. We're going to pull 1,423 of them out. Okay. Um, and the reason is because that's what the study did in the, that the ACLU uh, worked on. Um, so we're going to pull out 1,423 of them. Uh, and we're going to have to run this first. Okay. And so this is kind of one of our examples. So, so we reached into the bucket, we pull a bucket that is distributed like this. We pulled out 1,423 of them, and this was the distribution we got. So we expect, right, that this should be right around 0.15. This should be right around 0.18. And look, they are, right? It's, they're actually very close. Um, and so that's kind of what we expect to have happen. However, we haven't controlled for chance, right? So, um, and then this is showing us what happens with the panels. So we can kind of compare them next to each other, okay? So the eligible and simulated were pretty close, but the panels and the simulated are not very close, okay? So did we just get very lucky, okay, in that, they're not lucky, maybe anti-lucky, I don't know. You know. In other words, who knows, on our poll, they're just wildly different because we just did it once, right? I suspect, right, as you probably all do too, right, that that's probably not the case, but we don't know for sure. So we can't just say, well, these are wrong, right? These panels were not made up of the ethnicities uh, that are actually representative of the counties. We have to do it more often because we don't know for sure. Okay, so we just kind of put that in a bar graph so we can kind of compare. Um, and as you would expect, um, you know, our dark blue and our light blue are very similar. 
and our yellow is still what it was before, actually dark blue is as well. And then we go back to slides. Okay, where we have a question? Yay, question. All right. I really hope, yes. All right, get those answers in. Oops, I hit close before I meant to, but it's closed. Um, all right, so responses were largely correct. Um, I actually had a student make up many of the questions we use in the top hat stuff. I kind of tweak them or move them around or whatever, but I still want to know what a telling voluntary demeanor is because that sounds, um, it almost sounds real. So I bet the correct answer was the total variation distance. And we have another question. All right, so what is not a step in calculating the, the uh, total variation distance? All right, get your answers in. Gonna close it down. All right. And largely correct, although I realize that maybe that one should be like intermingled amongst the rest, make it a little harder. Um, but you get the idea. Um, it's important to kind of remember what this calculation is, uh, especially when we talk about like statistical methods, right? Especially that last part where um sometimes you're trying to clean up your result uh, even though it kind of makes it di like not comparison uh, not comparable to kind of your original data all right so hypothesis testing which is largely what we've been doing um and this slide we saw already um but same idea so i just kind of want to talk about uh the hypotheses um so when we have different kinds of scenarios, we have different mechanisms to do the testing, okay? And largely, we've been focused on uh, kind of the simplest case, um, but there's more, right? And we're going to get into more of those as we go. But what the reason I kind of made this set of slides is because I think it's important to kind of say kind of all in one place, here's kind of a lookup, right? It's like, okay, I got one sample, one category. And so, for example, the percent of flowers that are purple. My test statistic would be the empirical percent and then the absolute value of the null percent minus the empirical percent. And how do we simulate that? Okay, well, we use the sample proportion function um, and then how many we have and then the null distribution. So each of these are kind of like, I think the stuff that we've done in the Jupyter Notebooks, but kind of the formal terminology for the same idea. But, you know, kind of one of the things that I would be kind of taking notes on, right? is like basically a mapping of, okay, I've got this kind of scenario. What is the testing mechanism I use to prove that kind of scenario? Because you won't always have the answer, right? All right, but so I could also have one sample with multiple categories. And so despite my hanging parentheses over there, this is the, um, the court case we talked about last time, I think, um, where we have the ethnicity distribution of the jury panel. Um, and we could use the TVD as a comparison model, okay? And we use the sample proportions technique again, um, but uh, essentially our, our distribution will be more complex, right? Because the categories are more. Um, and then this is actually a little bit throwback. Uh, so one of the ones, we didn't actually talk about this specific example, 
Um, but we talked about using when we have numerical data, we can use the population data and sample. And we're going to talk more about that next time. One of the keys here, right, is where we get into with replacement and without replacing. Okay. So in this case, we're not going to do replacement when we do a numerical sample like this. Um, and uh, we'll talk about this, this particular example, I think next time um, at, with kind of wider examples. Uh, but these slides will be available, so you can certainly steal them. Um, and then we have two samples. Um, and so this, this is why I kind of want to leave the prior one in, even though we haven't really given a good example of that yet. But we have the birth weights for smokers versus non-smokers. So we have two sample groups, right? We have the non-smoking birth weights and we have the smoking birth weights. Um, but they're numerical, right? Because the weight is a, new, is a number. We can compare the numbers. They're not categories, okay? So, um, you know, ethnicity is a category, not a number, right? Um, and so the mechanism we use there is we can sample, but with replacement equal to false. Um, and so in a sense, this is one of the simplest mechanisms from an execution perspective uh, when we're trying to do these various techniques. And this is kind of the formal mechanism. This is the statistic that we use to compare or to discover the, the answer to the question. Um, so in other words, like this one I like is kind of a roll up. When we wanna test a hypothesis null and alternative, we kind of have to take into account which class of problem it is. And then we use different techniques, either different st test statistics or different simulation mechanisms based on the category of the you know kind of experiment we're trying to test. So that's why I like the summary slide, just trying to pull it all together to say, hey, here's all the different mechanisms we can use um, and why or kind of why we use that is that you know when we have two samples with numerical data, we want to use the sample method without replacement. Does that make sense? All right. Um, the next slide says causality, but it doesn't sound right. It's going to take forever to load. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. So then another thing or another way to think about kind of the same problem, it's kind of in terms of causality. So here's kind of a picture version of similar, right? Um, so we have an observational sample or a randomized controlled experiment. Um, and so we end up with kind of the sample data. We have two sample numerical data. Then one of the ways we can, or the way we can solve or uh, test our hypotheses for that is by shuffling the labels to simulate the null hypothesis, right? Because the alternative is the one we expect to kind of have happen. So the null is that nothing changes from the treatment. So we shuffle the labels to simulate that. And then we can come to a conclusion about association and causation. Um, so generally speaking, this will tell us that there's a causal relationship, okay? Or at least with the sample set that we have. So it's important to, to kind of draw that distinction, you know, where you'll often see this if you're reading like a, a study, you'll see, it'll say, you know, given the information that we have, we think there's a causal relationship here, right? Um, because you wanna have the caveat, this is why, you know, I talked about early on in the semester, it's like the theory of evolution, right? It's like, it's not proven, you know, there could be, you know, sunspots involved uh, in birth weights, who knows, right? But we can make a pretty good guess that there's a causal relationship between smoking and birth weight. Right. So, um, yeah. So just try to give it different ways of thinking about it. Um, and so this is, you know, our, can our conclusion be wrong? Right. Um, so if the test favors the null, the null is true. Okay. It can still all be wrong. Right. But this is kind of like another way of thinking about the same thing is test favors the alternative. Okay. That the alternative is true. So, what we normally want to do is construct the the you know no treatment you know treatment has no impact as the null and treatment has an impact as the alternative 
uh, and you know, and we're mapping it up uh, to try to get proof that the null is false. So that that means the alternative must be true. Okay. Um, let me just look at what else we've got here because we're almost out of time. Yeah, so I'm going to hit these two questions, or I think it's two. Um, and then if the test favors the null and the alternative is true, is the conclusion right or wrong? So this one is a little bit of a tricky or a little bit of a trick question, right? So remember what the conclusion is. We're setting out to, what are we setting out to prove? Something that we don't necessarily believe in, right? Which is the null. That's what we're setting out to prove. All right, get your answers in. All right, closing, maybe. Um, and so the correct answer is wrong, right? Because what we're setting out to prove is the null hypothesis. If the, um, if, you know, if the math comes out that the thing we're setting out to prove is wrong, then the alternative is true which is a good thing. That's usually what we actually wanted or expected, but technically speaking, what we're setting out to do is prove the null, right? So, uh, so yeah, there you go. Uh, all right, questions. I'm gonna stop there. We'll talk about Benford's law next time um, because it's longish for four minutes. Uh, any other questions? All right, cool. Um, actually, could Miranda come up and talk to me for a second? Yeah. Uh, shoot me an email or remind me, because uh, that's not right. It should be there. Yeah. 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 No, it's cool. So I do have some questions about the movement. Okay. I'm still a little confused on. The other chapter it says it was out of 80, and, and that email it said it was out of 80. Yeah, I'll go check it. Were you late? No, I said that. Uh, no, I mean today. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I, I did listen to that. Part. Okay. Yeah, I got to go sort that out. There's something There's something screwball about how the numbers are in there. Um, if we have like, questions about the data, like, go visit the office. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I just wanted to check. Did you submit all your labs? Okay. Um, I, I was looking, I kind of, that's why I was running late is I was digging into the grades. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I, I feel like there's something weird going on. Um, so yeah, I don't know how weird, um, but uh, I think there might be 